Hi class, welcome to chapter nine, weight management. So today we're gonna to talk about weight management and what weight management is, is keeping your weight at a healthy weight. And what that means is if you're overweight, you can lose weight. If you're at normal weight, you can take efforts to not gain or lose weight. And if you're underweight, perhaps you're gonna make efforts to gain weight. And although gaining and losing really are talking about numbers, um, I don't think healthy weight range has to be 100% about numbers. So when I'm talking about numbers, what I'm referring to as BMI, and we consider the healthy BMI to be 18 and a half to 24.9. But I don't necessarily think you have to fall within that range in order to have a healthy weight because many factors contribute to healthy weight, such as how you feel about your body, maybe athletic performance, um, personal preference, mental, physical, social, emotional health. And I think those factors play a big role with healthy weight just as much as perhaps the number on the scale does. But body composition is important too. So unfortunately, in general, as Americans, we have not been doing a very good job at keeping our weights healthy. And for these kind of epidemic or national or global statistics, we tend to use numbers to assess. So unlike your individual healthy weight, we, don't, we can't ask every single person in the world how they feel about their weight. Instead, we're going to look at numbers and draw some conclusions. And with regards to numbers, we're going to look specifically at BMI. And so anything between 24.9, so higher than that, to um, 29, or to 30 is going to be considered overweight and 30 or more is going to be considered obese. So we can track these statistics and the Center for Disease Control has actually done that. So we'll watch this video and I do have to keep it small otherwise the recording will stop. So these are obesity trends starting in the 1980s. And you can see in the 1980s that maximum of 14% of the population was obese. And they're defining obese as BMI over 30 or equal to 30, which is about 30 pounds overweight for a person who's five foot four. Now as time goes on, we see more states turning this dark blue color, representing higher prevalence of obesity. Now we have introduction of this kind of tan color over 20% obese. And you notice Alaska just went from tan to blue to tan, so it actually reversed for a little while. We have this orange category, over 25% obese, red, over 30%. Only one state still blue. Now no state still blue. Alaska's going back and forth between orange and red. And now we have green introduced, over 35%. So this slide goes until 2015, and this was the most current video that I could find. Um, but if we look at the next slide, we have statistics from 2016. And so they have actually done their colors a little different. So they did green as the lowest statistics, but they did dark red as the highest statistics with the dark red being over 35%. The shape of things to come. So this is a picture from The Economist, which is a magazine, and it's a super old picture, but even as early as 2003, they were predicting that our human evolution has actually stopped evolving in a positive way, and instead we're becoming kind of less physically capable and more overweight. And a lot of the reason for this may be because of fast food and sugar-sweetened beverages. So when we consume extra calories, what happens to those calories, whether we're consuming extra fat, extra carbs, extra protein, if we're eating more than the body needs, where do they go? Well, if we're consuming extra carbs, we can store them in the form of glycogen in our liver and muscles, and then we can store them in the form of fat. So as we consume an excess amount, we're going to store more and more fat, and it's possible that this fat could deposit around our abdominal organs, um, which is actually very metabolically unhealthy. 
as fat cells develop, multiple things happen. So our fat cells are capable of enlarging quite significantly. They can expand to be about 50 times their original size. So as we have this extra extra energy and we're converting it to fat, our fat cells can swell up to 15 times their initial size. And so they will swell. However, once they become saturated, our body will just create more fat cells. And so um, the more fat cells we have created, the easier it is for our body to store fat. And this is one of the reasons why childhood obesity is such a problem because in children, they can rapidly produce these fat cells, store their extra fat, and then they have those fat cells for the rest of their life. So for the rest of their entire life, no matter how they change their lifestyle or diet, their body always has this predisposition to easily store fat. Um, and that can make weight loss much more difficult as well as maintaining a stable weight. Another thing with this fat cell development is there's no way for these fat cells to die. The only way to get rid of them is through liposuction or surgical removal, which I had on this page. So it's better to just not develop these fat cells in the first place. Lipoprotein lipase. Lipoprotein lipase is an important enzyme and it's found on the fat cells themselves or the adipocytes and it promotes fat storage. And so people who have more of this enzyme store fat easier because this enzyme allows them to store the fat. People who are already overweight or have more fat cells have more lipoprotein lipase, meaning people who are overweight already tend to gain more weight and store more fat easier than people who are underweight or at a lean weight, and specifically because of this enzyme. Lipoprotein lipase is regulated by hormones, and one of the main hormones that regulates lipoprotein lipase is estrogen, um, which is primarily in higher concentrations in females. And estrogen will promote fat accumulation in the hips, the thighs, the breast, the buttocks, uh, giving most women this kind of hourglass-ish figure. When you lose weight, your LPL activity also increases. And so that can make keeping the weight off even more difficult. So really what I'm gonna get at through this entire slide set is the fact that losing weight is really, really difficult, um, not only from a mental standpoint, but from a physiological standpoint. Our body makes it hard for us to lose weight. And the reason it does this is for a survival mechanism because initially, you know, thousands of years ago when we were losing weight, that meant we were starving or there wasn't enough food to eat. And in order to survive, our body had all these compensation mechanisms to kind of cut down how many calories it would expend. So have you heard of the set point theory? I'm not sure if you have or not, but the set point theory is a theory that our body has its one set point. And no matter kind of what we do, our body likes to get back to that set point. Sometimes our set points can be adjusted, but our set point is regulated by different genetic factors, different hormonal factors, and different signals. So you see this woman here and she's attached to this kind of string and it's springy and this is meant to represent yo-yo dieting. So she starts a little overweight on the left, she loses weight, she feels great. However, after this initial weight loss, she goes back to her original weight. And in some cases, people can go back to bigger than their original weight. So what happens is as people try to lose weight, the body reacts to this by thinking that we're starving. And one of the things that it does is it slows down its metabolic rate, which is the rate at which it burns calories. So it will slow down how many calories it's burning in order to maintain its weight. And so 
say you're this lady at the far left and, you know, summer's coming, you want to fit in your bikini. So you go on the diet, you drop 10 pounds, you drop another 10 pounds. Now you're at the bottom here um, and you're feeling pretty good. And you thought, wow, I lost all this weight. Um, I think I can go back to my regular eating habits. Well, you can't because your body is smaller, so it's going to burn less calories. And with this weight loss, your body thought it was starving, so it really, really, really cinched down on its metabolic rate. And per pound of body weight, this smaller body size right here is going to burn less calories than this body size per pound of body weight. Um, so again, my little drawer is getting out of control. Um, but let's see, go back here. And so this can happen over and over again, which is the case in yo-yo dieting. So now she is very thin. She's fitting her bikini. She goes back to her normal eating habits, but her metabolism has slowed down. And on a pound, um, for a calorie basis, she's burning less calories for each pound than she ever used to before. So when she goes back to eating how much she used to eat, she gains more than she weighed in the first place. Even if she eats less than she used to eat and she exercises more than she used to exercise, she'll still tend to gain more weight than her original set point because of changes to her metabolic rate. And you can see that over time, while she's able to get back down to this kind of thinner weight, it ends up working against her. And so diets don't work. <laughs> and you can watch this TED Talk. It's fantastic. It has some really great explanation of the set point theory. Um, but it can be very physiologically difficult for a person who is trying to lose weight to lose weight and a person to gain weight to gain weight, who needs to gain weight to gain weight because of this set point theory. So the body literally works against you when you're trying to lose weight. Um, and many different factors fall into play as well, but this is one of the factors. Causes of obesity. So we have the set point theory. We can also look at genetics. And genetics do affect all sorts of different things, such as body composition, hormone production, you know, maximum height, muscle size, potentially, et cetera. Um, and genetics do play a role in obesity. However, the role that genetics plays is not that significant. Um, compared to other factors. And I kind of say that with a grain of salt. So what I mean by that is when we look at the changes in our obesity rates, the changes in our obesity rates are so substantial. You know, we've gone from less than 10% of the population being obese to over 35% of the population. And if we said that it was genetics itself, that would mean that our genetics in the last 30 years have changed 25%. Um, as far as our genetic code, meaning our DNA goes, that is not true. Our genetic code changes very slowly over time and does not account for the changes in obesity that we've seen. However, there's another factor that's called epigenetics, and epigenetics refers to the way that our genetic code is expressed, or the different proteins that our genetic code codes for, different hormones that might be turned on or off, etc. And we do think that there have been significant epigenetic changes, which aren't necessarily changes to the blueprints, but they're changes to the way the artist draws the picture. Um, so we're still learning about the role of genetics in obesity and investigating that further. There are some hormones that are genetically regulated, such as leptin and ghrelin, but genetics are not the only factors going into the regulation. In one genetic circumstance called prater willi syndrome, this is a very rare genetic disorder and it's characterized by excessive appetite, excessive eating, short stature, obesity, um, insatiable hunger, and that is obesity due to genetics. You can watch that video there. And then we think that our environment has played a very significant role in 
either epigenetics or obesity itself because our environment has changed substantially in the last 25 years. And changes in our environment do reflect changes in the obesity rate. So some of these different hormones that were pictured on the last slide. Um, leptin is a hormone that's produced by the fat cells as well as the stomach cells. And it is controlled by the O gene or the obesity gene. And so what leptin does is it helps people feel full or it helps people have a reduced appetite and it tells them that they don't need to eat anymore. Um, as you expend more energy, meaning you're burning more calories, leptin levels um, will be increased to cause this increase in energy expenditure. So leptin helps us control weight in the fact that it reduces our appetite and causes increased energy expenditure, meaning we're gonna burn more of our calories. And leptin will affect the hypothalamus, which is an area in our brain, which will send signals to the stomach as well as the rest of our body, telling us to eat or not eat. And people who have higher levels of fat tend to have higher levels of leptin. Very, very few people are leptin deficient, but leptin deficiency is possible. It's very, very rare in human population. In this image, they have induced leptin deficiency in mice. And so these mice are missing the OB gene, which codes for leptin. And so these mice will not have that leptin increasing their energy expenditure or decreasing their appetite. So these mice are always hungry and they're not burning as many calories. And so hence, both of these mice are overweight. Um, the mouse on the left is significantly more overweight than the mouse on the right, but they're both overweight. The mouse on the right has been treated with a leptin supplement. So in these super rare cases of leptin deficiency, you can treat with a leptin supplement and cause some of the weight loss and reduction in appetite that would be normal if a person or mouse was producing adequate levels of leptin. So in this way, we thought quite a while ago that maybe we could use leptin as a target for an anti-obesity drug. But what we find is that people who are overweight or obese do not have deficiencies in leptin, they actually have more leptin and giving them leptin, extra leptin doesn't help. So only in cases of true leptin deficiency can leptin be used as a treatment, but that's very, very rare. So unfortunately this drug avenue didn't work, but leptin is still an important piece to understanding the obesity puzzle. Ghrelin, ghrelin is a second hormone and ghrelin is produced by your stomach when your stomach is empty. So when your stomach is empty, ghrelin is secreted. Ghrelin also works with the hypothalamus and tells you that you're hungry. And so um, it will cause you to eat. As you eat, your stomach becomes full, the stomach secretes less ghrelin. So ghrelin and leptin are opposite hormones. And in some weight loss surgeries, they actually remove the majority of the stomach and they remove a part of the stomach specifically that secretes a lot of ghrelin. And so one mechanism of weight loss surgeries is reducing ghrelin. And since ghrelin makes you hungry, people who have had weight loss surgery aren't necessarily as hungry as you might think that they would be. Other things that contribute to obesity. So types of fat. When we consume excess calories, we can store them as fat. And we actually have two different types of fat in our body. We have white adipose fat, which is kind of our, our regular fat. This is what most of our fat is. And we use this for energy and we use it as ATP. And then we have brown adipose fat or brown fatty tissue. And this is a tissue that we used to have more of. Um, when you're born, you have a high amount of brown fat tissue and brown fat helps to create heat. And so brown fat really helps with temperature regulation. So it's really high in babies who have very high body surface areas and it's high in animals who hibernate. Um, and so brown fat actually can contribute to weight loss versus weight gain. And um, 
brown fat, brown fat levels slow down with age. So brown fat, we have less, less brown fat tissue as we age, as well as it's less metabolically active. They also find that brown fat is inversely related to BMI. So people with higher BMIs have lower levels of brown fat. Um, and so brown fat is another area that we investigate to think of the obesity kind of epidemic. So this is an interesting video and clip from Time Magazine that you can watch. For me, it took a couple minutes to load, but it's well worth the watch. It's only a couple minutes lost, long, and it's talking about brown fat, the role of brown fat in thermoregulation, and then the use of cold therapy or being cold and the fact that when you're cold, you are burning more calories. So they have looked at cold therapy um, and you can actually look at the Wim Hof method. This is kind of related to cold therapy, kind of related to breathing techniques, but it can change your body composition and metabolism. So that's pretty cool. This is a picture looking at brown fat um, or brown adipose tissue on the right and white adipose tissue on the left. So white adipose tissue is where we store energy. Brown adipose tissue is where we actually use energy to make heat. So by potentially changing our proportions of white adipose tissue and brown adipose tissue, we could maybe possibly change our metabolic rates. Browning. This is something new um, that our book has introduced. And it's talking about cells undergoing a process called browning, which is where they act like brown cells. And remember that the brown fat cells are producing heat and not storing fat as energy. And so these would be beneficial. Environmental contributors to obesity. So overeating, um, and I'm not saying people necessarily intend to overeat, but I think large portion sizes as well as inexpensive, high calorie, high fat foods, high sugar foods do contribute to overeating. Um, obesogenic environment, an obesogenic environment is an environment that is obesity promoting. So it's an environment that promotes weight gain. Maybe that means there are high prevalence of fast food restaurants or gas stations, low prevalence of grocery stores, or there's a food desert. Maybe the person lives in a city without any sidewalks or parks or good area to be active outside. Um, driving everywhere. We drive everywhere. So our roads are obesogenic. You know, we don't have to walk or ride our bikes. Time. Many people work more people than any ever before. And so working limits time to cook. Physical inactivity can contribute to obesity. I mean, you don't even have to get out of your car anymore to go get food. You can order food to your house. It can be delivered right to your door. You barely have to move. You know, you don't even have to pay out of your wallet. You can pay using your phone. Um, people are doing less activity than ever before and consuming more calories and the wrong types of calories than ever before. And they say in order to prevent weight gain, we need to do a minimum of 60 minutes activity a day of moderate activity or 30 minutes of vigorous activity. Um, and I don't think most people are doing this. So what causes obesity? I just talked about many factors. We talked about genetics, environment, inactivity, portion sizes, maybe effects of advertisement, hormones, ghrelin, leptin, different fat types, white fat, brown fat. Um, the list could go on. I mean, you, there are books written about the causes of obesity and documentaries and so many things. You almost couldn't find something that's not causing obesity. Um, and that's a little bit of an exaggeration, but you get the point. So we're going to skip that. And some issues with overweight and obesity. So there are health risks with overweight and obesity, um, but there can also be risks to losing weight or certain ways that people maybe go about losing weight. So some examples, what if somebody is overweight, but in otherwise good health, meaning they have good blood pressure, they feel happy, they, have, they don't have high glucose, you know, they don't have high cholesterol or high triglycerides, they have a normal heart rate, 
they're able to be physically active, but maybe by their BMI, maybe their BMI is like 26 or 27. Would you recommend that they lose weight? I personally would not. I would say if they're healthy and happy and just a little bit over that weight range, they can continue doing what they're doing because some of the risks of overweight are significant. What if somebody is obese or overweight and they do have risk factors? So maybe they're at risk for developing diabetes. Maybe they have prediabetes or maybe they have high blood pressure. And so they're at risk for a heart attack or stroke, or maybe they have some family histories of these diseases. Then I think I would suggest that they try to monitor their weight and see if they're able to reduce their weight because generally speaking, reductions in weight, if you are obese or overweight, can reduce those risk factors. So people who are obese and pre-diabetic can actually reverse the fact that they're pre-diabetic by losing weight. Um, same thing with blood pressure. Losing weight can help reduce blood pressure for many people. Cholesterol, triglycerides, different eating patterns, and healthy weight can support healthy triglycerides. So if somebody was overweight or obese with these risk factors, I would work with them to help them get on a healthy meal plan, meal pattern, cooking at home more, and you know, increasing physical activity so that those risk factors don't develop into full-blown disease. What if somebody is over obese or overweight with a life-threatening condition? So maybe they already have heart disease and their chances of having a heart attack are really high. Maybe they already have diabetes and it's out of control and they have blood sugars in the 400s. Maybe they have sleep apnea and they're actually stop, stopping breathing at night. Um, in that case, I would definitely recommend a diet, lifestyle, social, intervention to help this person get to a healthier weight, thereby reducing those life-threatening conditions and maybe changing their full-blown out-of-control diabetes into diabetes that's well-controlled or maybe even having it go all the way back down to pre-diabetes. Um, maybe they have a blood pressure that's 200 over 90. Maybe we can get that blood pressure to 160 over 90, which is still high, but better than 200. Um, and I actually met a patient just the other day who told me she was 300 pounds. She had undiagnosed celiac disease. She couldn't even imagine going to the gym. Um, she had had one heart attack. She was pre-diabetic. She had high blood pressure, taking all sorts of high blood pressure meds. She had thyroid issues, taking thyroid meds. And she decided to lose weight. And this woman is kind of the exception. She was miraculous without any help from professionals. She lost 140 pounds all on her own. She developed her own recipes. She's actually now created Facebook groups with these recipes. Um, and she said, you know, something had to change. And the doctors wanted me to have bariatric surgery and told me that was my only option. And I said, no. And so diet is so cool and nutrition is so cool because we can reverse so many of these diseases or reduce the risks of these diseases. Um, but losing weight is hard as I've started to just explain. And so it's not necessarily for everybody um, because it can be both physically hard, um, physiologically hard, psychologically hard, socially hard, emotionally hard, etc. So you really need to weigh the pros and cons before you're going to recommend um, a weight loss program for somebody. Perceptions and prejudices. There are perceptions and prejudices regarding people who are underweight, people who are normal weight, people who are overweight, obese, and I don't know too many of these perceptions and prejudices that are common. Um, at times in my life that I've been leaner, people will assume that I have a super fast metabolism and that I'm just naturally that way. And I don't like that perception because I know that I work out every single day for at least an hour and I run and I rock climb and I bike and I, you know, go to bed early and I reduce stress levels and I eat healthy. So I don't like when people perceive that it just comes easily for me because it doesn't. Every day is a set of multiple decisions to 
kind of maintain my weight where it is. Other things, underweight, sometimes people will think people have eating disorders. That's also negative. Um, overweight, there are many negative prejudices, like people are lazy or they're not taking care of themselves. And those just create a lot of shaming and are inappropriate and unfortunate consequences of weight, both under and over. Problems of overweight and obesity. So if somebody is overweight or obese and is trying to kind of remedy this or reduce their weight, they may go to dangerous interventions. And I could talk about surgeries as being potentially dangerous. Um, generally, you have to be approved for surgeries. You have to have a full medical workup. However, I do know quite a few people that are traveling to other countries where the regulations for weight loss surgeries are a lot less stringent, and that can be dangerous as there's lifelong implications of those. Fad diets can be dangerous as they might be severely low in calories or nutrients, causing nutrient deficiencies or calorie deficiencies. Um, Over-the-counter drugs, if taken inappropriately, can be dangerous. And many dietary supplements contain illegal ingredients or ingredients that put people at risk for heart attacks or kidney failure. And so all of these interventions to treat obesity need to be considered and evaluated thoroughly. Herbal products and supplements. So they do have many side effects and they're not regulated by the FDA. So that means when you go buy even something like a multivitamin or a mineral, or maybe you're buying some tea or um, some sort of essential oil, there's no guarantee that what you're buying actually has what it says it has in it or that it's safe or that it won't interact with any other medications. Um, a previous herbal supplement that was common for weight loss was ephedrine, and it's been banned for quite some time, but it was found in multiple different weight loss products that are sold you know, in just normal vitamin type stores or bodybuilding type stores. It's also available in different brands sold over the internet. Um, there's another one called k and this also contained ephedrine and was banned. And so you just really have to be careful when you're buying these different products in case they contain dangerous ingredients that you might not know about. They also don't have to declare, I mean, they do declare, they say what ingredients are in there, but they don't necessarily have to prove that to anybody. There are drugs that are prescription and over the counter. And so you can read about some of them in your book. One of them is Orlistat. This used to be prescription. It's now available over the counter. And Orlistat works by inhibiting pancreatic lipase, which is one of our pancreatic enzymes that can break down fats and use them for energy. And so by inhibiting pancreatic lipase, it causes fats to move undigested through the GI tract, which if they move undigested through the GI tract, they're going to end up in the large intestine and the stool. And so there's pros and cons of this. The pros are that you don't digest 30% of your fats, so you don't get the calories from fats. Some of the cons include that you can um, be at risk for fat-soluble vitamin deficiencies, and when you don't digest something, it ends up in the toilet, and undigested fat is very, very, very unpleasant to have pass through your body. So people who take this pill tend to have oily, greasy stools and gas, and um, that's uncomfortable for them, which is both good and bad. It's bad that it's uncomfortable, but because of the discomfort with that, they usually change their eating habits to eat less fats, which then can help with weight loss. Um, Phentermine interacts with norepinephrine and can help suppress appetite, but some risks of it include increased blood pressure, heart rate, insomnia, nervousness, dizziness, and headache. And so you can see that all of these drugs are not without risk. There are many types of weight loss surgeries out there, and some of them are more invasive than others. One of the newer ones on the market, which I don't have pictured here, is the gastric balloon, where you literally swallow um, 
a small inflatable balloon and it's inflated in your stomach to fill up space. And remember when our stomach is full, um, we don't have as much of that ghrelin released. And so we don't have as much of that hunger hormone released. And depending on the type of balloon, you can swallow two balloons and then they stay in your stomach for a while and then they can be removed um, surgically or deflated. Pictured on the left is a traditional gastric bypass, and this particular part is called a roux and Y. And so a small section of your stomach is stapled off, and so your stomach, instead of being kind of this large, um, I don't know, oh, half circle shape, is now only the size of a golf ball, so it only holds a tiny amount of food. And then the duodenum, which is the first part of your intestines, and part of the jejunum, which is the second part, is actually connected lower down, and then the rest of the jejunum is moved up to this small pouch of the stomach. And so what's happening here is you have nutrient um, malabsorption because you're bypassing a large section of the small intestine and you also have a restrictive space for foods to go so you have to eat smaller portions and so this Roux and Y procedure is both restrictive and malabsorptive and very effective although it does have lifelong side effects and it's not reversible. On the right, we have the gastric band, which is where they literally put this belt-like band around the top portion of the stomach. They can tighten it with a port out under the skin, um, and it creates a small pouch for food to go. That can reduce caloric intakes, but people can stretch this pouch and cheat this pouch, which can lead to eventual gain back of weight. But these are options that are out there. The gastric band is a lot less invasive and it is reversible. So other ways to treat obesity. We can definitely work on eating patterns. So we can be, you know, realistic about portion sizes, energy intakes, snacking, you know, how often are we doing it? What types of snacks are we having? Eating late at night. We can look at environmental factors. So, you know, where are we when we're eating? Are we on our couch? Are we at our desk? Are we in our car? Or are we sitting down at the table? We're leaving the food on the counter versus bringing the whole dish to the table. Um, you know, do we have the whole bag of chips or have we taken some chips out and then gone to eat them? Are we stressed? Are we happy? You know, what's our environment like? Physical activity, simply moving more and sitting less. And then behaviors and attitudes, which can be, you know, maybe interest in cooking or interest in changing the way that one prepares foods or different friends that they hang out with or places that they go, or ways that they're eating, different places to shop, etc. Environmental factors. So specifically, all of these things can impact our obesity rates and our propensity to gain weight or potentially lose weight, but generally we're in an environment where we're gaining weight because we're in an obesogenic environment. So you have to look around the atmosphere and the accessibility. You know, this particular picture, the guy is on the couch, he's got a giant two liter soda and a whole bag of chips next to him. The chances that he's gonna have just one portion of that soda and just one portion of that bag of chips are really, really small because he has no way to gauge a portion and they're right there, they're easily accessible. Had he poured some of the soda into the glass and maybe put some of the chips in a bowl and then put them back in the cupboard in the refrigerator, they would be less accessible and he'd actually have to physically stand up, move, meaning physical activity, to go get more, which takes a lot more effort than you would think. Um, Social settings, you know, are you at a Super Bowl game? Are you at a barbecue, 4th of July, you know? Sometimes social settings cause people to overeat and eat more than they're actually hungry for. Sometimes there's different foods served at social settings versus at home, and so that can influence um, caloric intake as well. Distractions, are you thinking about the food that you're eating, you know, being mindful of the food, enjoying the flavor and the texture of the food and taking time between bites? Or are you in a hurry running to school or running to work and eating something as fast as you can? Um, 
multiple foods. So when people are offered multiple foods, they tend to overeat and they like to try them, have a little bit of each. It's kind of called like the buffet phenomenon. Um, and so maybe if you keep your food choices simple, you know, that can help cut back on consumption. Packages and portion sizes, as well as serving containers also contribute. So you're more likely to overeat from a larger package or a larger portion or a bigger plate or a bigger cup. So even simple changes like switching out the size of your plates at home or switching out the size of your glasses. I had a patient whose husband was consuming 16 ounces glasses of soda at a time. And she said, yeah, I just can't stop him. He goes and he pours the soda from the two liter, you know, into his glass and there's 16 ounces and he has at least two or three a day. And I said to her, I said, why don't you get smaller cups? And she said, I never thought of that. And I said, yeah, just get smaller cups, get rid of those 16 ounces, put eight, eight ounces there. At the very least, he's gonna have to take twice as many trips to the refrigerator to fill that 80 ounce, eight ounces, but the chances that he'll go there as often are really low. Um, so those are some strategies you can use. Looking at caloric density. So choosing foods that are filled with nutrients, that are filled with water, that are filled with fiber versus filled with sugar and fat um, can allow you to eat so much more volume wise, which is going to make you feel full and satiated and make you um, not have as much ghrelin released because your stomach's going to be full. So both of these meals are equal in calories, but the one on the left is full of sugar and fat. And the one on the right is not full of sugar and fat. It's full of these very healthy, low calorie foods. So you can eat so much more with that type of an eating pattern. And sometimes that's called a volumetric eating pattern. Additional things. So behaviors for weight loss. Um, maybe you're going to change some behaviors so that it will be easier for you to increase energy expenditure and reduce calorie intake. So some examples might be not going shopping when you're hungry. I know I'm guilty of this. Maybe you could say you're not going to shop at Costco because you know how full, no matter how full you are, if you shop at Costco, you're going to eat all the samples. I'm also guilty of this. Maybe you're going to make grocery lists when you shop. So you only buy the things you need and you don't end up buying things that might be tempting or less healthy. Um, Maybe while you watch TV, you're going to make a point to get up at the commercial breaks and do some jumping jacks or some burpees or some push-ups. Or maybe um, you have the ability to put some sort of workout equipment in front of the TV or move the TV to the garage next to the workout equipment. I have an elliptical machine and I bought it about nine years ago. I think I paid $300 for it, which at the time I thought was a lot, but it's lasted that long and because of that machine I have not had to get a gym membership and I have that machine right in front of my TV so there were times when every morning I would wake up and I would do four miles on the elliptical which take me 45 minutes or so or an hour it was about exactly the same time as a show on TV and then at night I would do the same thing and watch another show watch documentaries watch whatever I liked and I loved it because I was watching TV, but I was also moving my body. Um, so those are just some tips. You definitely want to start with small goals and see if you can get others involved. So maybe you want to do like a weight loss challenge at work or a walking group or a hiking group. Um, and you might start with saying, you know, I'm going to take a 10 minute walk three days a week after dinner. And that's what you're going to do. You don't have to start by deciding to run a marathon or, you know, anything crazy like that. Small goals are more achievable. When you achieve goals, you're more posed to try something bigger. Other weight loss strategies. So this is looking at kind of volumetrics again. And on the right, we have the stomach that's filled with vegetables. Um, on the left, we have oil. And then in the middle, we have chicken. It looks like fried chicken. So the more foods that you eat that are low in calories, the bigger volume of those foods you can eat, which is going to make you full, which is going to cause reductions in ghrelin. 
when you're talking about weight loss, weight loss should be slow and it should be reasonable. So you don't ever want to decide that you're gonna lose 20 pounds by next week. That would not be healthy or sustainable and would cause your body to go in uber starvation mode, which would alter your metabolic rate significantly. A safe rate for weight loss is a half to two pounds a week. So half to two pounds a week. And that could be about 10% of your body weight in six months. So you do not want to lose a lot of weight very quickly. When you lose weight slowly, you're less likely to experience those shifts in set point, And that weight loss is more likely to be sustainable. As far as super low calorie diets go, um, it's never recommended that you do a super low calorie diet without the supervision of your doctor and dietitian. But if you were to, for men, you don't want to go below 1200 calories. And for women, you do not want to go below a thousand calories a day. Other behaviors that are associated with healthy weight are eating breakfast. I know you've heard it a million times, but it's no joke. They're doing studies more and more about circadian rhythms and wake and eat and sleep cycle and learning that breakfast is the most important meal of the day because you're most insulin sensitive, as well as not eating late at night. And then maybe instead of doing the six small frequent meals, which is traditionally taught, Instead, we're only going to do three meals and we're going to have, you know, three to five hours between those meals where we're fasting. That can also produce weight loss. Keeping the weight off. So exercise, 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 and just have a, have a lifestyle that's active. For example, maybe you can walk to the grocery store. Maybe you can ride your bike to school, um, park farther away, you know. Go play with your child or your dog after work or in the afternoons. Um, be mindful of what you eat and eat less. And I do have here less energy and fat. I will say that this fat, um, this is definitely kind of older thinking. We're still pretty confident about less energy, um, but as far as fat goes, there are many diet patterns that are high in fat that can contribute to weight loss, and that's a newer kind of way of thinking. We used to think that fat and high fat diets caused weight loss, um, but now we've learned that that is not necessarily the case. So that is that. So anyways. Oh, another thing I'll say, frequent self-monitoring. A lot of people who lose weight and keep it off um, keep food journals, meaning they write down what they eat every day or perhaps they uh, weigh themselves daily or weekly and they, they're always kind of keeping track of what's going on. As far as exercise goes, I think I already said 60 minutes moderate or 30 minutes vigorous. An ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. I, I would like to say an ounce of prevention is worth like 10 pounds of cure. Because as we've learned, weight loss is pretty difficult. And so the best strategy would be to try to reduce or lower weight gain in the first place. And you can do this by regular meals. So like I said, actually cutting back on the snacks. We used to think that was a good weight loss strategy was small, frequent meals, but we know now that it's probably not the best weight loss strategy. Drinking water instead of soda or juice that's not 100% fruit juice or sugared coffee beverages, small portions. So reading the labels, finding out what the serving sizes are, and then comparing that to what you've actually been eating. Staying active. You know, you don't have to join a gym to be active. There are plenty of places that you can be active for free on campus. You know, you can go to local parks, you can go to the beach, you can hike some of the local trails. We generally have good weather. <clears throat> and live in a pretty safe place, and then get involved in community programs. There's community programs for exercise, for shopping, for weight loss, etc. Some of the national strategies are listed here, and starting in schools is very important since 
children who are obese are more likely to become overweight or obese adults. Underweight. So we don't have as much of a problem with underweight as we do overweight, and underweight represents only a small percentage of our population. Some of the causes are listed there. There are genetic diseases as well as issues with appetite, metabolic issues, um, sicknesses, difficulty swallowing. This is common in children and elders. And if the underweight is significantly causing health problems such as reduced immune function or anemia or low energy levels or low cognitive function, it is a significant problem and we would try to remedy that with healthy high calorie snacks. And so we would do kind of the opposite of what we would do for weight loss. So we're going to eat energy dense foods. I have trail mix pictured here because although trail mix is a healthy food, it's loaded in calories. An average quarter cup of trail mix has about 180 to 200 calories. But the good thing is they're healthy calories. So coming from nuts and seeds and dried fruits, um, eating regular meals, eating larger portions, adding snacks, high calorie snacks, adding juice or milk, and exercise. Those can all help with weight gain. So fad diets, we're really not going to talk a lot about fad diets, but these are some that have been around, and I would add to that uh, ketogenic, paleo, um, maybe Whole30, there's a whole bunch more out there right now. And so fad diets, how can you tell if they're kind of fads or if they're scams? You really need to be kind of investigative, so you need to ask the questions, um, what is this diet promising? Does this diet cut out significant macro or micronutrients? Does this diet exclude certain food groups? Um, is this diet going to put me at risk for any, you know, nutritional deficiencies? Do I have to buy a certain product or a certain supplement to be on this diet? Or is this something that I can make using normal foods in the grocery store? Do I have to be shipped a certain meal to be on this diet? Um, are there any like supplements you have to take with this diet? How quick is the weight loss as promised by this diet? Is it a safe rate of weight loss or a rapid weight rate of weight loss? Who came up with this diet? Was it a doctor? Was it a dietitian? Was it um, you know, just somebody off the street? Have they done any studies on this diet? And I don't mean personal testimonies where you have you know, Georgia here who says she lost 15 pounds using it, or um, Paris Hilton who has tried these Akai Pure Powder and it blasted away those pounds, which Paris Hilton didn't ever have any extra pounds to blast away, but that's another story. Um, but you need to look at all these things. Have studies been done? What type? Who funded them? Did the company pay for them themselves, et cetera? And that can help you kind of evaluate if this will be safe or not. And you can always ask your doctor or dietitian as well. So quiz. With weight loss, fat cells, what happens to them? They only decrease in size, so they don't go away, they just shrink. Obesity is caused by all of the above. The protein produced by the fat cells under the direction of the OB gene is called, hopefully you remembered that this is leptin. The biggest problem associated with the use of drugs in the treatment of obesity is D, adverse side effects. A realistic goal for weight loss is to reduce body weight by C, 10% over six months. A nutritionally sound weight loss diet might restrict daily energy intake to create a 500 calorie per day deficit. With a 500 calorie per day deficit, you're gonna lose approximately a pound a week. Successful weight loss depends on reducing energy intake and increasing physical activity. Physical activity does not help a person to 
lose fat in trouble spots? Which strategy would not help an overweight person to lose weight? Eat energy dense foods regularly. Which strategy would not help an underweight person to gain weight? I'm gonna say drink plenty of water. Even though drinking water is super important, it's not gonna help you with weight gain because water doesn't have any calories. So that's all for this chapter. Thank you for listening and I'll talk to you next time.